Hello, everybody. Today we're going to be talking about poisonous plants, and I thought I'd start off with this picture of the gate to the Onik Poison Garden. There are several poison gardens around the world where they have living collections of poisonous plants. This one in Northumberland, near the Scottish border, is part of the gardens at Onik Castle, where, incidentally, they shot many of the outdoor scenes in the Harry Potter movies. A few years ago, we took a family trip to the UK primarily because this poison garden exists. And I wish I could say that many of the pictures in this presentation came from that trip, but they didn't. The tour through the poison garden was, frankly, a bit of a disappointment, but the overall gardens in the castle were awesome, so check it out if you ever find yourself in the north of England. All right, so here we are at the title slide. This presentation about poisonous plants is part of a series for the Wilderness Medicine Fellowship, covering those topics in the overlap between wilderness medicine and medical toxicology. This was created as a companion presentation to the one about poisonous mushrooms, so the learning objectives here overlap. And speaking of learning objectives, here they are. After watching this presentation and studying the relevant supporting materials, learners should be able to name at least 12 poisonous plant and 4 poisonous mushroom species. Common names are okay, but scientific names get you bonus points. Be able to detail the molecular mechanisms of the toxicity of those species, when known, and to describe their clinical presentations. And be able to identify at least three poisonous plants or mushrooms that have specific antidotal therapies. As with most of toxicology, supportive care is commonly all you can do and is all that is needed. But for which species discussed here are there actually antidotes? Unlike animals, plant and fungus species don't have many ways to defend themselves. Many species have developed irritating, noxious, or poisonous chemicals to fend off predation. Therefore, as a general rule, it's a good idea to avoid eating any plant or mushroom in the wild that you can't confidently identify as edible. However, this presentation is not about wilderness survival, so we won't be focusing on identifying edible plants and fungi. Although this topic may come up indirectly, especially in cases where edible and toxic species are easily confused. Also, the list of potentially toxic plants is very long. But there are many species where there's no reasonable way a prudent person going about their business in the wilderness would get poisoned by them, so we're not going to cover them here. Here on the right-hand side is the list of poisonous plants that we are going to be discussing in this presentation, and the order in which they're going to be presented. It's a pretty long list, but for many of these plants, there's only going to be a few points to make. We'll start with plants of the deadly nightshade family, the Solanaceae. Many of these plants contain toxic amounts of tropane alkaloids, such as atropine, as shown in the upper right. Tropane, atropine. The plant actually called deadly nightshade is Atropa belladonna. Tropane alkaloids are found throughout the plant, but are in high concentrations in the dark purplish-black berries. The genus of this plant, Atropa, is named for one of the fates in Greek mythology. The fates created the threads of each mortal's life, measured it, and then Atropo would cut the thread, ending that person's life. The species name, Belladonna, comes from Latin, meaning beautiful woman, since the juice from deadly nightshade berries was used cosmetically to cause pupillary dilation, to make the eyes appear more seductive. However, deadly nightshade is not the most common Solanaceae plant causing human toxicity, because that's jimson weed. Datura stramonium is the most common source of poisoning we see by the Solanaceae family. On the left, this botanical print shows the shape of the leaves and flowers. When the flowers are pollinated, the petals will dry up and fall off, and a seed pod, or thorn apple, then develops, which eventually splits open to release a couple hundred seeds. Although, again, the entire plant contains tropane alkaloids, especially atropine and scopolamine, these compounds are highly concentrated in the seeds. The name Jimson weed is a bastardization of Jamestown weed. The plant's common name comes from Jamestown, Virginia, since a well-publicized mass poisoning occurred there in 1676 during Bacon's Rebellion, an early American armed insurrection against the British crown. This was documented in 1705 by historian Robert Beverly, who wrote that some of the soldiers sent to quell the rebellion ate plentifully of the weed, the effect of which was a very pleasant comedy for they turn natural fools for several days. One would blow a feather in the air, another would throw straws at it with much fury, 
A third was sitting naked in a corner like a monkey making faces at them, while a fourth would kiss and paw his companions, sneering in their faces. They were confined, lest in their folly they should injure themselves, and after eleven days they returned to themselves and couldn't remember what had happened. What he's describing here is an anticholinergic delirium. As you can see on the map here, Jimson weed is certainly found in Virginia, and it grows wild throughout much of the United States, including Southern California. I took the photos here during some hikes in Carbon Canyon Regional Park in Brea. Jimson weed flowers are pretty impressive. They are trumpet-shaped and are typically white and or purple. Deterra stramonium also grows easily in urban or suburban areas, often found along the roadside or in construction zones. In fact, Jimson weed grows in close proximity to UC Irvine Medical Center, as I'm going to show over the next few slides. On the right, we see Interstate 5 as it passes by the medical center. For several years, I've noticed a patch of Jimson weed off of Orangewood Avenue near the Del Taco behind an apartment complex. And I'll also be showing some pictures taken here near the southbound I-5 off-ramp next to the Ayers Hotel. Here's a closer aerial view of the Del Taco at State College in Orangewood and the apartment complex parking lot where the Jimson weed is found. This is a ground level establishing shot looking westward along Orangewood with the Wells Fargo building along State College Boulevard in the background. If we were to take State College to the south going underneath the I-5, it becomes the City Drive once it crosses Chapman Avenue immediately adjacent to the medical center. Here's the Jimson weed and flower at that location. You can also see the faux Spanish tiled roof of the Del Taco in the upper left. This photograph is from 2007, before the Ayers Hotel was built and the site diagonally across from the medical center was a vacant lot. Here we see some more Jimson weed with many flowers about to unfurl and bloom. And just 10 yards away from that Jimson weed, on the other side of a chain link fence, I found this specimen. We see the broad, jagged-edged leaves, which look a lot like jimson weed leaves, and the dark purple berries of deadly nightshade. Thus, I found both jimson weed and Atropa belladonna growing wild less than one minute's walk from UCI Medical Center that day. Brugmansia is another Solanaceae plant that you can find in urban and suburban areas. There are several Brugmansia species that all go by the common name of angel's trumpet, after the trumpet-like shape of the flowers, and these are ornamental plants imported from South America. I took the photo on the left during a walk around my neighborhood. Brugmansia sanguinea, on the right, is so named because of its deep red, blood-like, or sanguine color. Here is an Images in Clinical Medicine case from the New England Journal of Medicine, showing isolated ocular effects in a three-year-old boy who was playing with Brugmansia flowers from the garden and then rubbed his finger in his eye, causing unilateral medriasis. The parents brought him to the hospital with a concern for an intracranial catastrophe because his pupils were unequal. But of course he was perfectly fine, alert, and playful because this was simply a local anticholinergic effect. Here, however, is a more concerning case of Brugmansia poisoning that I saw in 2009. This man had altered mental status after eating some flowers, which the family gave to the paramedics to bring in with the patient. I can try to verbally describe what an anticholinergic delirium looks like, but it's probably much more effective to show it instead. Hallucinogenic effects of Jimson weed can be a living nightmare. I seen a pile of dead bodies and it started coming to life for me. And I seen just spiders on the wall, ants were crawling around. 17-year-old James Freeze of Chula Vista, California knows all about Jimson hallucinations. After drinking a large dose of Jimson brew tea with a friend, the two got so high they were brought into the local police station for observation. If you ever wanted to know exactly what Jimson weed could do to you, pay very close attention to what you're about to see. It's a tape Chula Vista police made of James and his friend under the influence of Jimson weed. The two are so impaired they can't even speak Speak. Again, what you're about to see is no act. James is the one on the right. I'm taking some drugs today. James and his friend are truly in a world known only to them. Here you see them pass a cigarette to each other, only there is no cigarette. James' friend later smokes it and actually flicks the ashes. Again, there is nothing in his hand. 
James styles his hair with an imaginary comb. He beckons to friends in the room that only he can see. There is fear in the eyes of both boys and major anxiety. Motor coordination skills are almost completely gone. We watched this tape with James Freeze at his home. He'd never seen it before. It's okay, go ahead. The thing that's so scary is I don't remember anything about this. I don't remember anything. James Freeze, you should know, is a former habitual drug user who's been in rehab. He's tried everything from pot to crack. How does this Jimson weed stack up? Well, it's crazy. I mean, from my experience, this is one of the stupidest things I've ever done in my life. Not every kid, of course, will OD on Jimson weed the way James did. But because Jimson weed is a poison and its level of toxicity varies from plant to plant, one can never be sure. Keep Gloria just with five if you want to do okay. two, and then we'll have you take that one, yeah. Okay. Unless Michelle wants to take ten, and then I can use all I do. She can still use yeah. the touch. Oh, just that. move her foot a lot more. Yeah. I can cover that. Okay. Purple OG. I can cover the radio. We saw that the tropane alkaloids cause anticholinergic effects, which include an altered mental status characterized as a delirium. Patients can be alert, even hypervigilant, but they may not be in close contact with reality. They will also show other signs of an anticholinergic toxidrome with dilated pupils, dry mouth and skin, and tachycardia. Treatment is primarily supportive, with IV fluids and sedation as necessary, often with benzodiazepines. Consider inserting a Foley catheter in patients with significantly altered mental status, since urinary retention is fairly common. Physostigmine is a specific antidotal treatment for anticholinergic delirium that can be considered in some cases. Interestingly, this drug also comes from a plant, Physostigma venenosum, the calabar bean plant, so it's almost like fighting fire with fire. Physostigmine should only be used under close monitoring. It is sometimes quite effective, but the effects only last for a short time, making supportive treatment with IV sedation as needed an attractive option. The figures on this slide are from a case report showing how effective physostigmine can be. The clock face in the upper left was drawn by an anticholinergic patient with mildly altered mental status. We see the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 5, then ham and beans. Five minutes after getting half a milligram of physostigmine, the patient was able to draw a much better clock face, and it continued to improve a few minutes after that. I don't know if I'd be able to do any better. And with that, we're finished talking about Solanaceae plants and the tropane alkaloids. Our next topic is plants with cardiac glycosides. Cardiac glycosides are found in several plants and can cause digoxin-like toxicity. On the left, we see a photograph of foxglove digitalis purpurea, or purple digitalis. Despite the genus name, this is not the botanical source of digitalis glycosides used therapeutically. Digoxin comes instead from the less colorful and less splashy species called Digitalis lanata. Some other plants containing cardiac glycosides include squill, from which some older rodenticides were made, and lily of the valley. Oleander plants also contain cardiac glycosides. The typical oleander is nerium oleander. It is a very hardy plant that grows well in warmer climates of the United States, and it's commonly planted for landscaping and along highways in California. Another species called yellow oleander is also planted for landscaping in America. The fruits of the yellow oleander, containing a large seed, are called lucky nuts, although they aren't particularly lucky. They are the size of a large walnut and are ingested as a favored method of suicide in several South Asian countries where the plants occur naturally. Here is the structure of digoxin as an example for all of the cardiac glycosides. There is a glycone portion, which in digoxin is a series of three sugar moieties, and the rest of the molecule is the A-glycone portion. This part of the A-glycone contains a tetracyclic steroid nucleus, and the remainder has a lactone ring. Cardiac glycosides found in plants have a five-membered lactone ring and are called cardenolides. There are also cardiac glycosides found naturally in some animals, including humans. They have a six-membered lactone ring and are called bufadienolides, but we're not going to talk about them further since this is a discussion about plants. 
Over the next few slides, I'm going to demonstrate the molecular mechanisms of how cardiac glycosides work and how they cause toxic effects. Starting on the top left of the cardiac muscle cells shown here, we see the voltage-gated sodium channel opening to allow depolarization as the sodium flows down its chemical gradient from the higher levels outside of the cell to the lower levels inside the cell. The wave of depolarization spreads over the cell and causes L-type calcium channels to open, allowing extracellular calcium to enter the cytoplasm. This triggers calcium-dependent calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that calcium interacts with calmodulin and troponin, allowing the actin and myosin to interact and result in the muscular contraction of systole. During diastole, the system has to reset. Sodium-potassium ATPase pumps out the sodium that entered the cell during depolarization, and this is accompanied by pumping some of the extracellular potassium into the cell. Some of the now cytoplasmic calcium is removed by exchanging it for extracellular sodium, which is still a lot higher than inside the cell through a sodium-calcium antiporter. And the rest of the excess cytoplasmic calcium is actively pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Lower cytoplasmic calcium levels allow the muscle cell to relax and we get diastole. Removing the positive charge of the sodium and calcium from the cytoplasm also restores the normal polarization of the cell to the normal resting membrane potential shown here as roughly negative 90 millivolts. And the cell is then ready to go through the cycle again. Cardiac glycosides inhibit the sodium potassium ATPase, which has several results. We are pumping less potassium into the cells, so the extracellular fluid will have relatively more potassium in it. But if we aren't pumping as much sodium out of the cell, there will be a relative increase in intracellular sodium. This decreases the efficiency of the sodium-calcium antiporter, and we therefore also have a relative increase in intracellular calcium. This extra boost of calcium, though, is uptaken into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, such that when the next depolarization occurs, slightly more calcium is released, and we get a slightly stronger muscular contraction. This is how digoxin and other cardiac glycosides, at therapeutic doses, can improve inotropy and relieve symptoms of congestive heart failure. However, with toxic doses of cardiac glycosides, we get an excessive amount of increase in intracellular sodium and calcium. This raises the resting membrane potential closer toward the threshold for depolarization. This increases automaticity, which is the tendency for the cell to depolarize again and trigger another beat. This predisposes the heart to generating arrhythmias. Also, the increased intracellular calcium may overwhelm the ability to pump it up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. If we can't remove that cytoplasmic calcium, the muscle cell can't relax and will get diastolic failure. In experimental animals, it's even possible to make cardiac glycoside poisoning so bad that if you administer additional calcium, there can be a systolic arrest where the heart just stops in full systole, a so-called stone heart. In addition to the myocardial effects just discussed, cardiac glycosides produce autonomic effects too. Just as the sodium-potassium ATPase inhibition causes myocardial cells to become relatively depolarized, it relatively depolarizes other cells too, including baroreceptor cells in the carotid sinus and aortic arch. This fools the baroreceptors into reacting the same way they would if there was systemic hypertension, and that signal of, oh my god, my blood pressure is too high, is sent up cranial nerves 9 and 10 to the vasomotor center of the brainstem. This results in increased parasympathetic tone being sent down the vagus nerve to the heart, which slows down the rate of action potential generation at the sinus node, resulting in bradycardia. The increased vagal tone also causes some AV nodal blockade, which would help to control rapid AFib by reducing the number of aberrant depolarizations that were conducted through to the ventricles. This is another potential therapeutic effect of cardiac glycosides in treating AFib and CHF. With cardiac glycoside toxicity, we will typically see bradycardia, but any number of cardiac arrhythmias might also occur, since there is also increased automaticity and AV block. The most classic cardiac arrhythmia is atrial tachycardia with variable AV block. The most pathognomonic arrhythmia with cardiac glycoside toxicity, although it is rarely seen, is bidirectional ventricular tachycardia. Other systemic effects include nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, fatigue, weakness and confusion, and a visual disturbance of seeing yellow halos called xanthopsia. And we'd expect to see hyperkalemia with severe cardiac glycoside toxicity because we're preventing potassium being pumped from the extracellular fluid into the cells. In fact, hyperkalemia correlates pretty well with prognosis. 
However, if a patient has hyperkalemia from cardiac glycoside toxicity, you don't want to treat with calcium since the cells are already overloaded with calcium, as we've discussed already. There's the risk of inducing diastolic failure. Treatment for cardiac glycoside toxicity is primarily supportive. If a patient has life-threatening arrhythmias, then anti digoxin antibodies are indicated. Many textbooks talk about two products, Digibind and Digifab, which are nearly equivalent fab fragment biologic therapies, although Digibind is no longer being manufactured. Unfortunately, you can't calculate how many vials you might need based on the serum digoxin level, nor by the amount ingested. Although you'd expect a patient poisoned by non-digoxin cardiac glycosides to have a detectable digoxin level, there's definitely not a one-to-one -one cross reactivity. So you'd have to treat empirically, which would be 10 to 20 vials for life-threatening dysrhythmias. Next, we're going to discuss the castor bean plant, Ricinus communis. It has these large multi-lobed leaves that somewhat resemble cannabis, except that there's an even number of lobes and it produces these colorful spiked bean pods, which each contain three castor beans, which are each a bit larger than a coffee bean. The beans are sometimes used for ornamental purposes since they have a beautiful cross between a tiger stripe and zebra stripe pattern to them. Castor oil can be pressed from these beans, which has both industrial and medicinal uses, and the beans also contain the highest amount in the plant of a protein toxin called ricin. Like Jimson weed, castor bean plants also grow in environments of intermittent, infrequent human activity, like roadsides and construction sites. The photo here is from a construction site near the Big A Stadium while they were building the apartment complex called The George across from the Golden Road Brewing Company. You can see the Wells Fargo building on State College again in the distance. Here is another castor bean plant growing through the chain link fence adjacent to the southbound I-5 off-ramp onto State College in front of the Ayers Hotel. The plant is recognizable by its multi-lobed leaves. And the ground in that area is just littered with dried seed pods and castor beans from earlier plants growing at the same site. Here's a closer look at ricin, the protein toxin produced by castor bean plants. Its mechanism of action is to inhibit ribosomes, so it prevents protein synthesis in affected cells. In the upper left, we see that ricin has a heterodimeric structure meaning that it has an A chain and a B chain, which are connected by a disulfide bond between cysteine amino acid side chains. And this heterodimer motif is seen in several plant and bacterial toxins, where one subunit determines which tissue it combined to before being uptaken into the cell, conferring target specificity, and the other subunit produces the intracellular toxic effect. With ricin, the B chain allows the toxin to bind to galactose sugars on the cell surface. The whole toxin is then endocytosed and makes its way to the Golgi apparatus. The ricin is then transported in a retrograde fashion to the endoplasmic reticulum. The two ricin chains separate, the A chain enters the cytosol, binds to ribosomes, and enzymatically inhibits them by removing an adenine nucleotide from the 28S ribosomal RNA. The cell now can't produce enough protein and will die. Thus, Ricin causes a cytotoxic effect to whichever tissue it's able to enter. Most poisonings from ricin occur from chewing and ingesting castor beans, and this can result in acute gastroenteritis with a degree of severity roughly correlating to the amount ingested. Several case reports of castor bean ingestion involve three children who each eat one of the beans from a seed pod, and these cases are often relatively benign. Mild cases result in gastroenteritis within a few hours, and resolving within a day. Ingesting more ricin results in worse toxicity with the possibility of hypovolemia and liver or kidney injury. If death occurs, it will be within a few days from multi-organ failure. There are no specific therapies, so treatment is entirely supportive. Aerosolized ricin is a potential biological weapon. Ricin is very easy to find, but it's actually quite difficult to purify and process it into an aerosolizable form that can be used as a weapon. However, that hasn't stopped people from trying to do so, and there have been multiple domestic ricin terror threats since 9-11. If someone did inhale aerosolized ricin, they would develop an acute pneumonitis and possibly die from non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Some Russian spies in the 1970s and 80s were issued umbrella guns that could shoot a small metal pellet out of the tip. The man shown here is Georgi Markov, a Bulgarian dissident, who was living in London when he was jabbed in the leg with an umbrella, 
which appeared to be an accident and he didn't think much of it at the time. He developed a sepsis-like syndrome within a few days and died. During his autopsy, a 1.5 millimeter metal ball fell out of his calf. The ball had two tiny holes drilled through it, and even though no ricin was recovered, it was hypothesized that ricin was the only known poison that could have killed someone in this manner at the possible injected dose. In the brief era of normalization of Russia's attitudes towards the West, the KGB admitted that such ricin pellet-firing umbrella guns were used. Abrus precatorius produces a similar bean with a protein toxin called abrin that causes similar effects to ricin. The seeds from this plant are a bright shiny red with black ends that almost look like tiny beetles. They are often used for ornamental purposes, including making rosary necklaces. In fact, the beans are sometimes called rosary peas. Abrus grows in the tropics and subtropics. In the U.S., it is only found in the wild in Florida. Several plants produce poisons that activate voltage-gated sodium channels, affecting nervous and cardiac tissues. You'll recall that the voltage-gated sodium channels have two gates, the M gate and the H gate, and exist in three conformational states, closed, open, and inactivated. These plant poisons tend to keep the sodium channels in the open state, allowing for more depolarization of the electrically active cells and interfering in the normal cycling of the channel through the different conformational states. These plants had been used for medical purposes in the past, but all such uses are now obsolete. You still may find these plants listed in homeopathic so-called remedies, but at least if it's actually in homeopathic doses, they are so infinitesimally small that no toxicity can be expected. But if someone made their own preparations or ingested these plants, they could be seriously poisoned. This is Aconitum napellus, from which we get aconite. It is also called monk's hood because the blue flowers resemble the hoods or cowls of monk's robes. The cardiotoxic active ingredient here is aconitine. Various veratrum alkaloids are derived from hellebore species, such as veratrum album or white hellebore, shown here. Rhododendron species produce gryanotoxins. The species name pontigum here in Rhododendron ponticum refers to the ancient Greek kingdom and later a Roman province called Pontus, which is part of modern Turkey along the Black Sea coast. Rhododendron species grow there naturally, and the honey produced from their nectar can contain gryanotoxins. This mad honey has caused poisoning outbreaks in both ancient and modern times, and it's also sold online for reputed hallucinogenic properties. I'm not convinced it's hallucinogenic, or even that what is sold as mad honey actually contains gryanotoxins, although it usually has a darker, redder color than normal, and has a high markup. There are no specific therapies for poisoning by aconite, veratrum alkaloids, or gryanotoxins. Various CNS effects and dysrhythmias may occur, among other effects, the treatment for which would be supportive. Colchicum autumnale is occasionally consumed when mistaken for a wild leek or garlic. This plant is the botanical source for colchicine. The mechanism of toxicity is that colchicine inhibits intracellular microtubule assembly so that it impairs cell motility and mitosis of rapidly dividing cells. Basically, this produces the same effect as radiation poisoning, although through a chemical rather than physical mechanism. Ingestion of even two seeds is dangerous, producing a slightly delayed mucositis and gastroenteritis, and other effects, potentially including bone marrow suppression with larger exposures. Strychnine also comes from a plant source and has an interesting neurotoxic effect, although ingestions fortunately are quite rare. Strychnine blocks glycine's normal inhibitory action on spinal alpha motor neurons. When glycine binds, it allows chloride ions to enter the neurons, hyperpolarizing them and making them less likely to fire. If you remove this inhibition, you get uncontrolled motor activity, or tetany. Strychnos nux vomica is the plant source of strychnine, which is most concentrated in the flat circular seeds found in the red globular fruits. Clinically, the tetany seen from strychnine poisoning is indistinguishable from tetanospasm, the toxin produced by Clostridium tetani bacteria. You may see rhesus sardonicus and or epistotonus from extreme extension of postural muscles. Next, we're going to look at plants of the Apiaceae family, which include carrots, parsnips, as seen here on the left, and other domesticated and wild edible species. Of course, some plants in this family are poisonous, and we'll get to those shortly. 
Another name for this plant family is the umbellifers, which is Latin for bearing parasols, since their flowers are arranged in a characteristic umbrella-like pattern. Don't worry about the spelling here. Umbella and umbrella are basically just two ways of spelling the same Latin root. Also, these plants, including the roots, all smell like carrots or parsnips, which might induce someone foraging for food to eat them. Both poison hemlock and water hemlock are in this plant family, and have caused fatalities when mistaken for edible species. Poison hemlock, or conium maculatum, is on the left side, and water hemlock, secuta verosa, is on the right. Both of these plants have umbel, or parasol-like flower arrangements, and roots that smell like carrots. Poison hemlock contains the poison conine, which is a nicotinic receptor agonist. It will therefore bind to and activate receptors at the autonomic ganglia and at the neuromuscular junction, resulting respectively in sludge syndrome, various other autonomic effects, and muscular weakness or paralysis. Classical scholars will remember that Socrates was killed by ingesting poison hemlock. Obviously, the plant can be found in Europe near the Mediterranean Sea, and it also grows throughout much of North America. The conium part of the species name clearly relates to conine, the toxic component, while maculatum means spotted, just like we'd call colored spots on the skin macules. The macules or spots on poison hemlock are these purplish brown spots on the stems. Water hemlock contains sicutoxin, which is a GABA-A chloride channel antagonist. We normally have some amount of GABAergic tone, allowing chloride ions to enter neurons to hyperpolarize them and make them less likely to fire. Sicutoxin prevents this hyperpolarization, this inhibition of neurons, resulting in uncontrolled neural firing and seizures. Four species of water hemlock grow in North America, primarily in wetlands and along streams. The photograph here shows Secuta verosa with its humble arranged flowers growing right next to the water, as the name water hemlock suggests. If you needed to, you could differentiate the edible and poisonous wild umbellifers by looking at their stems. Water hemlock has smooth hairless stems, poison hemlock has smooth purple spotted stems, while the edible wild carrot or Queen Anne's lace, referring to the flower arrangement which looks surprisingly like lace, has a hairy unspotted stem. You can see that the scientific name for Queen Anne's lace, Daucus corota, is exactly the same as the domesticated carrot, although the domesticated carrot is designated as subspecies sativus, which just means cultivated. Many plant species contain calcium oxalate crystals and can cause systemic oxalosis if they are not prepared properly. For instance, fresh raw rhubarb is poisonous. Most of the calcium oxalate, though, is in the leaves, and we generally don't eat them. Rhubarb is typically prepared by parboiling the stalks and throwing out the water that now contains much of the oxalic acid. Acute oxalate poisoning, though, is much more of a problem for livestock than for humans, since they'll eat any and all parts of the plants they find to feed on. However, the more common way that calcium oxalate crystals in plants cause human poisoning is via sharp raphid crystals. Here we see Diefenbachia, a common household ornamental plant. Many plants of the Araceae family contain calcium oxalate raphide crystals. This also includes another common house plant, the philodendron. The raphid crystals are found in cell components called idioblasts, where they are packed in tightly like arrows in a quiver. These idioblasts release the raphide crystals when the plant tissue is disturbed, so if a plant is cut or chewed, the raphides shoot out, injuring the mucosal tissue it comes in contact with. Diefenbachia is sometimes called dumb cane, since the injury to mucosal tissue can render someone incapable of speech. That is, they are temporarily struck dumb. The photos here show two children who chewed on plants containing calcium oxalate raphides. The child's tongue on the left is quite swollen, and there is even a blister that formed on the tongue's left lateral edge. The girl on the right looks like she's in more distress, and she's having trouble handling her own secretions. As with most of the plant poisons we're talking about, the only treatment to offer is supportive. Phytolaca americana, or pokeweed, grows wild throughout much of the eastern United States. It is an edible native species, although it too must be cooked properly. The most traditional dish involving pokeweed is a poke salad, prepared by parboiling the greens a few times and throwing out the water in between. 
The main toxic components in pokeweed are saponin glycosides. Saponin sounds like soap, and actually also means soap, in that these compounds are amphipathic. They act like a detergent or soap because a portion is water-soluble and another portion is lipid-soluble. Eating soap will, of course, result in a foamy gastroenteritis. The pokeweed berries, however, contain the least amount of saponin glycosides. Children often play with the berries because they can be used as an ink and can temporarily stain the skin. The berries are also used to make a pokeberry wine. Another kind of saponin glycoside is found in real licorice plants. Glyceriza glabra contains glycerizin, a saponin glycoside that's about 50 times sweeter than sugar. Traditionally, the roots of the licorice plant are chewed for the sweetness of the glycerizin content, and they were sold in small tied-up bundles. This explains the appearance of candy licorice sticks, which pretty closely resemble licorice roots. The toxicity from real licorice, however, is much different than from pokeweed. Excess consumption of real licorice causes pseudohyperaldosteronism. The lipid-soluble portion of the glycoside here, glycerotenic acid, looks a lot like the hormone aldosterone. And it acts a lot like aldosterone, too. It blocks the conversion of cortisol to cortisone, so you retain relatively more mineralocorticoid action than glucocorticoid action. It blocks the catabolism of endogenous aldosterone, and it may also have some direct agonist effect at mineralocorticoid receptors. This results in sodium retention, leading to hypertension, edema, and potential congestive heart failure, as well as promoting renal potassium loss, hypokalemia, and the potential for weakness, arrhythmias, and even cases of rhabdomyolysis. While we're on the topic of sweet plant poisons, we'll move on to some that are associated with edible fruit. Aki fruit comes from the plant Blyhia sepita, named after William Bly in 1793. Bly received this recognition because of his successful mission to transport plant food sources from their natural habitats to other regions so they could be used to fuel the population and the economy. Aki is found in tropical Western Africa and the Caribbean and is a staple food in a few cuisines. This is indeed the same Captain Bly, although he was actually only commander at the time, from the Mutiny on the Bounty that occurred in 1789. On that earlier mission, Bly was transporting breadfruit, another tropical staple crop, from Tahiti when the mutiny occurred. Fortunately for Bly, he survived an incredible escape journey, and his career thrived afterward. Unripe ackee fruit contains hypoglycin A, which causes Jamaican vomiting sickness. Ackee trees grow all around the Caribbean and are a very popular food source, particularly in Jamaica. As they ripen, the fruit splits open, revealing the black seeds in a yellow-white spongy aril, which is the edible part, and has a consistency like scrambled eggs. In fact, ackee and saltfish is recognized as the Jamaican national dish. So, Jamaican children are well aware that ackee is edible, and they might be tempted to pick some of the fruit for a snack. And if the fruit isn't ripe, it still contains enough hypoglycin to cause toxicity. Rarely, some less-than-ripe fruit can be sold and eaten remotely, resulting in Jamaican vomiting sickness in the continental U.S. Hypoglycin A acts by inhibiting the beta-oxidation of fatty acids. Beta-oxidation is the normal way we derive energy from fats, where we break off two carbon units from fatty acids, converting them into acetyl coenzyme A, which goes into the Krebs cycle. Hypoglycin acts in two ways to inhibit fatty acid metabolism. First, it inhibits the carnitine transporter mechanism that carries fatty acids from the cytosol into the mitochondria. And second, it inhibits the acyl-CoA dehydrogenases involved in the beta-oxidation cycle. What happens clinically is the rapid development over just a few hours of abdominal pain, vomiting, hypoglycemia, CNS effects with altered mental status and possible seizures, and a fatty degeneration of the liver with hepatocellular necrosis and the accumulation of microvesicular fat deposits since the fats are not being metabolized. These are actually the same findings that occur with RISE syndrome, which is believed to be due to viral and salicylate-associated inhibition of fatty acid beta-oxidation. Podophyllum peltatum also produces a potentially edible fruit called the mayapple. However, the unripe fruit and the rest of the plant is poisonous. This plant grows wild in much of the eastern United States, 
and the young plants can be recognized by their multi-lobed green leaves with lobes that droop down slightly like a parasol, sometimes described as like a mushroom shape. The May apple fruit is shown here in increasing states of development and ripeness, and it's said to taste like a cross between a grape and a pear with a hint of citrus. Podophyllum peltatum is also the botanical source of podophyllotoxin, which is cytotoxic and the structural basis for a few anti-cancer drugs. Podophyllotoxin itself causes a colchicine-like inhibition of microtubule assembly, which prevents cell mitosis, while its cancer drug derivatives such as etoposide are topoisomerase inhibitors, which is another mechanism of preventing rapidly dividing cells, like cancer cells, from replicating their DNA. The raw resin from the plant is called podophyllin and is used topically to burn off warts, such as condyloma acuminata, basically by burning the tissue through its toxic mechanisms. The next toxic fruit I'm going to discuss are hot peppers, the fruits of capsicum plants. TRPV1 is among several temperature-sensing receptors affected by food chemicals. Depending on the normal temperatures that activate these receptors, various plant chemicals may be perceived as cool, warm, or hot. Capsaicin is the active ingredient in peppers, which activates TRPV1 receptors, causing hot peppers to be perceived as hot regardless of the actual physical temperature. TRPV1 stands for Transient Receptor Potential Cation Channel Subfamily V Member 1. The letter V here stands for Venallele, since that's the group on the aromatic head of the capsaicin molecule. TRPV1 receptors are normally activated by the presence of free protons, like in acids, osmotic changes, temperatures above 40 degrees Celsius, and capsaicin. The figure here says temperatures above 43 Celsius, 109.4 Fahrenheit, which is certainly true, but the previous figure showed that it can be activated by a range of temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius. There has also been some research into how to put out the fire from hot peppers, and it's been shown that milk with higher fat content works best, presumably because capsaicin's hydrophobic tail dissolves better in it. And no discussion of capsaicin or hot peppers would be complete without mentioning the Scoville scale. This scale is based on how much an extract from various peppers needs to be diluted for it to not taste hot. Basically, anything on the scale in the red zone here is barely tolerable, and the peppers in deep red at the top are basically poison. The poinsettia plant is commonly regarded as poisonous, but this is a false reputation. The poinsettia has beautiful red and green foliage, so is commonly used as a Christmas time household ornamental. The reputation as being poisonous mostly stems from the case of a two year old son of an army officer stationed in Hawaii who was found dead in the early 20th century after apparently having eaten some poinsettia leaves. And of course, the name poinsettia is spelled very nearly the same as poison. But the plant is not named for poison, but for Joel Roberts Poinsett, who was the first U.S. minister, what we'd now call an ambassador, to Mexico, and he introduced the plant to the U.S. in the 1820s. Poinsettias are basically non-toxic, although some mild adverse effects can conceivably occur. It will cause GI irritation, but it takes ingesting quite a few leaves, probably more than anyone would ever eat. And contact dermatitis has also been reported, which is fairly common for plants of the Euphorbiaceae family. The last major topic I'm going to discuss are the toxicodendron species, poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac. These plants are well known for causing a delayed vesiculating dermatitis. Several species of poison ivy, poison oak, and poison sumac are found throughout the United States. Poison ivy is found over most of the U.S. except the Pacific Coast. Poison sumac is found in the eastern U.S. And there are two varieties of poison oak, with the Pacific poison oak found all throughout California. Technically, toxicodendron species are not poisonous, but instead are potent allergens. Toxicodendron comes from the Greek, meaning poison tree. Dendron here means tree, and thus dendritic means branching, like a tree. So now, the phrasing of the dendritic pattern of herpes keratitis should make more sense. You may also see references in the literature to Rus dermatitis, which is the same thing as toxicodendron dermatitis, since these plants were previously classified as a subgenus of Rus. Since the Pacific poison oak, Toxicodendron diversilobum, is the only species in our immediate area, we should be able to identify it. 
The leaves are in groups of three at the ends of branches, and on longer branches the leaves sprout off first on one side and then the other. The leaves are a bit shiny, have scalloped edges, and may be any color ranging from green to red. In the upper right, we see the reddish leaves of a specimen of poison oak contrasting with the green leaves of an actual oak tree. The reason the leaves are shiny is that they are covered with urushiol, an oily mixture that induces an allergic contact dermatitis. Urushiol contains several catechols, including pentadecyl catechol, which has a 15-carbon chain off the phenyl group. These are metabolized in the skin into quinones, which are very chemically reactive and bind to proteins in the skin forming neoantigens. These neoantigens are detected by Langerhans cells and through a process you learned about in your immunology courses, will set up a type 4 or delayed cell-mediated hypersensitivity. More than half of the population is sensitized to Arushiol, and there are a few other plants in the same family that are cross-reactive with toxicodendron species including ginkgo, cashew, and mango. I knew that I was sensitive to poison oak already, and I discovered this cross-reactivity once after eating unskinned mango one summer when I ended up looking a lot like this. Now I'm going to show you several examples of reactions to toxicodendron species. Milder cases cause erythema, edema, and papules, while more severe cases develop vesicles, bullae, and angioedema. Skin eruptions are often patterned due to how the leaves deposit urushiol on the victim as they pass by and through the plant. Obviously, if all you saw was grouped vesicles, you've got to keep a herpetic rash on the differential diagnosis. Here's a case with particularly large bullae in a curvilinear pattern. You can also see plaques of confluent papules, presumably from a more diffuse deposition of urushiol on the skin. And in this case, the arushiol deposited in the geniculate fossa behind the knee, leaving a weeping plaque of vesiculated skin. Since the reaction here is delayed, victims often may not know right after they've been exposed to toxicodendron species. But if the arushiol is not rapidly washed off, they will develop a rash within a few days, which can last two to three weeks. In milder cases, potent topical corticosteroids should work, such as clobetazole 0.05% BID. More severe cases may need systemic steroid therapy. Non-prescription treatments are available but have limited efficacy, including hydrocortisone, diphenhydramine, or applying topical drying solutions such as Domboro. Prevention through avoidance is key. However, there are a few commercial products that may help in the decontamination process. Technu is basically a combination of mineral spirits used to wash off the arushiol. Zanfel uses various alcohols and anionic surfactants for the same purpose, while lotions containing bentoquatum clay dry on the skin to produce a physical barrier to prevent arushiol from absorbing into the skin, giving you more time before you have to wash the whole thing off. Lastly, we're going to look briefly at phytophotodermatitis. Several plants contain light-sensitizing chemicals called sorolins, which result in a delayed dermatitis in sun-exposed areas. The pictures on the left show the progression of a pretty severe reaction with blistering of the hand, and the young lady on the right ended up with hyperpigmented areas on her face that should slowly resolve mostly or completely. There are a few plant families more notable for causing phytophotodermatitis, including carrots and citrus, and there have been a number of cases of people playing drinking games with citrus fruits on vacation, resulting in a dermatitis sometimes playfully called Lyme disease. And once again, we're at the gates of the Onic Poison Garden, signaling the end of this presentation. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll be seeing you around.